Good morning, Dan. Morning, everyone. Thanks, Dan. How's it Good. going? Good. Good. How are you? Yeah, well, thanks. Excellent. Uh, I'm Jules McConnell, um, work for the APF uh, and Sport Development, Ronnie and I. You've been chatting with Ronnie mostly. Yes, I've um, been with Ronnie. Yeah. yeah, but we've been working on this together. So thanks so much for joining us. Of course, thanks for the opportunity. Mm. Yeah. Looks like we're getting some people signing up. Might give them a couple of minutes to start. Morning, Riz. Yeah. Morning, Riz. Jules. Hey, how's it going? Oh, James. Yes. Hey. <laughs> hey guys. Hello, AB. Hey, was this an annual event that you have and uh, you've just had to put it online? Yeah, we generally do it um, every two years before the World Championships. Um, okay. And yeah, have either done it at, at the AIS. Um, it's been quite a few years since we've used that. Um, uh, the last one was actually at um, because we hosted the World Championships in 2018, so we actually did it at the location, which was really cool up in right. Queensland. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Cool. And would uh, you be doing some jumps as well? Uh, no, generally no, because um, yeah, we, we're just limited with time and opportunity. And obviously, at the AIS, you, it's there's no real place to jump there. Yeah, no. Um, so it's mainly just been um, seminars with. Um, with various, uh, uh, yeah, um, people like yourself, just to give yeah. us some other tips and tricks. You know, there's lots of stuff that we can learn, not skydiving, that can really benefit. Can yeah. Background. Yeah. So sure, there's a lot of. Uh, <laughs> just, just for housekeeping, I might ask everyone to mute themselves um, while Dan's talking. And what you can do is um, you can type in the chat. Um, if you have any questions and then how do you want to work it, Dan? Do you want to make it more interactive or have you got something to discuss and then Yeah, well, I've, um, I've tried to look questions through, at the end. I'd like, yeah, I'd like to keep it interactive. I've looked through a few articles um, trying to, to figure out how biomechanics and physiotherapy as well can, can help uh, skydivers. A lot of the research that I do look into comes from the army though. So that's why I'd want your input because I'm sure you use different equipment and you use, you know, use different landing styles. So Sure. Yeah. I think it's less landing for a lot. We've got, um, as Ronnie would have um, shown you with all the videos of the different disciplines and looking at the group so far, um, we don't have a lot of people um, from landing disciplines yet um, okay. here. It's more more free fall disciplines so people might have more um yeah anyway we can open it up to people um, um but if you wanted to give more of a general overview and then we can open it up and people can just start asking questions in the chat and you can answer them i guess yeah sure all right um so once again if you just checked in if you can just mute yourself um just so that we can watch dan and listen to him and then ask questions in the chat room yeah. Um, take it away, Dan. All right. Again, thanks for having me, everyone. So I'll, I'll go through just a brief intro. I'm sure you saw the video that I would have uh, put up um, that Ronnie made for you um, that, I, that I took in the Biomec lab. Um, so I'm a physiotherapist. Uh, I've been practicing for about seven years. Um, and then I did a master's degree in human anatomy because I wanted to get a bit more information um, about, about the human system. And then I went on to a PhD at, um, I'm still doing a PhD at UC, um, University of Canberra for landing biomechanics. So I don't have to talk too much about landing. I want to see how this might apply to, to other things. But um, yeah, I'm looking at trying to uh, look at landing and how, how it relates to lots of sports and how um, we can try to change people's landing patterns to try to reduce injuries. Uh, because landing is a skill, or just like anything that you do in sport, um, it requires a bunch of motor patterning to, um, to perform a skill. Um, and we tend to practice a lot of throwing, we practice a lot of kicking, um, we practice a lot of tumble turns, but landing is not something that we usually practice quite a lot. Um, it is practiced quite a lot in dancing or gymnastics, but not other sports, uh, despite the volume of landing that they do do. So that's sort of where my research is at. Um, but I also do a lot of teaching for um, anatomy and biomechanics. Um, 
So in our biomechanics courses, it's really cool because we get all these students, um, a lot of our athletes, um, and we get them to do assignments where they do um, analyses of certain movements and they have to use biomechanics to you know, describe them and say how they could potentially um, improve them. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't had any skydivers in. That would have been great to have a skydiving student in to uh, analyze a skydiving posture or a maneuver. Um, so that's why I'm quite interested to, to be talking to you guys and seeing how uh, biomechanics um, plays into your, into your field and what things that you're interested in, um, in terms of uh, injury prevention, um, performance enhancement. Um, and I'd like to just go through and see what the, the disparate disciplines that you're, you're in. Because I have looked through the videos um, and it seems like it's not just a single field, it's, it's a massive field of all these different branches. So I'd like to just maybe pass it over and see what fields that we have and what manoeuvres that, uh, that you guys are actually having to go through in your, in your sport. So first of all, Jules, do you, um, do you still, are you organisation or are you jumping as well? Um, look, I'm mainly doing administration, uh, but I've ha I have been competing for the last 12 years in canopy formation. So that's um, right. the videos you would have seen where the, um, we jump out, we open the parachute straight away and we link um, together by putting, hooking our feet in the lines of the other parachutes. All right. How long does it take you to actually form the canopy after you've all you know, jumped out of the plane? Um, we want to get together within 30 seconds of exiting the aircraft um, and then our time starts and there's three disciplines. Um, the two-way sequential, we have 60 seconds of working time. Yeah. Uh, Four-way rotations is 90 seconds of working time. And then four-way sequential is um, 108 or 120 seconds or two minutes of working time. Gosh. And so um, I'm sure that took a lot of um, practice to try to gain the skills to first of all maneuver yourself through the air and then come up with those postures. Do you do a lot of land-based training um, or is it all just having to do a lot of jumps to get that? Oh, we do a lot of um, physical training for uh, upper body, body strength, um, core strength. Um, in two-way and four-way um, it's really important to have both left and right um, the same amount of um, dexterity, I guess. So yeah. for me, when I was training two way, um, I used to do a lot of um, like throw a ball with my left hand, you know, and throw it with my right, um, kick the ball with my left, like throw it from left to right, left to um, yeah. left, to left. And, and just to try and because I felt like my left side wasn't as was much, was weaker than my right side, yeah. and I needed um, because we moved as much from either side. It was okay. really important. Um, I feel like I can turn much quicker to my right than my left. Yeah. Um, so, and yeah. With those exercises, do you have some sort of format of exercises to train, um, to train you for those manoeuvres, or is this something you just came across yourself? I just came up with it myself, yeah. I've done a lot of juggling um, over, the year, over the years, and I think that's helped. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, and also some... Um, I guess climbing or even aerial, like just trying to, um, you know, you, you kind of often do um, one side more than the other. So trying to practice that weaker side. Yeah. yeah. Skateboarding, like um, going goofy instead of natural, you know, um, or, um, or fakey. Yeah. <laughs> so just trying to. Um, um, that ambi dexterity. Yeah. Yeah, I found that the most important, as well as the strength and conditioning, which, again, I did my own sort of training. But after having, you know, PT um, um, and then just going and doing it on my own, but getting some help from, um, from professionals, yeah. So are there other people in the group that also do this canopy um, formation? Because I'd like to hear from them. Hello. And what kind of training do you do? Do you do something completely different or...? I think the, the mic's off. Sorry? Oh, hang on. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi there. Okay. Howdy. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm very old, so um, whatever I do is... Uh, anyway. Um, 
Jules is right. The 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 dexterity of it. Um, I mean, my body doesn't move as much as as well as it as it used to, and as much as I'd like to. But um, uh, I do exercise physiology. Um, well, I haven't been doing it actually for the last month or so, but um, but I do that a couple of days a week, and uh, and and working on upper body strength, um, uh, mainly because there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, chin ups, if you like, over grasp chin ups. That um, um, that's the the uh, that's how it relates to in 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 the CRW side of things, yeah. um, and but uh, so double double grip um, um, front rises or double grip chin ups, and then and then also a lot of pull downs um, with one arm and, and then the other arm um, yeah. as well, and uh, and apart from Apart from that, uh, certainly, um, certainly twisting the body, you know, keeping keeping your core uh, fairly flexible is is important, um, and uh, and I probably need to work at that more than more than the average person. Yeah, does that sound right? Because <laughs> I imagine core stability would be such an important thing in in you know gaining stability as you're free falling, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, we only free we only free fall for a few seconds, so um, you know, that's not that's not as important. We don't we don't work on on uh, on the arching side of things as much as a as a free fall uh, manoeuvre. But yeah. um, get out of the plane, and as long as we're on heading and we open our parachute within the re required three to you know, three seconds or so, um, then then we start working there, and it's and it's mostly upper body movement. Okay. So then, uh, when you're performing, say the canopy, what are the main things that people are? How do how do you fail at it? Like, what are the main things that you're unable to do, or an amateur might might find difficult to do? Um, you really need to do a lot of short inputs. Um, you know, quick, sharp, short ones. If you if you're not strong enough to be able to to do that strong input. Uh, as quickly as you as you should, then okay. you, you may not move as far as you need to. Alternatively, if, if you hold on to it for too long, then um, uh, then you can get away from the formation. Yeah, yeah. And does it typically take quite a few tries to 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 you know get the position that that you desire? How many jumps would you need? Well, because the whole the whole thing is very fluid. You you've got you you the amount of distance that you move also depends upon how far the the rest of the formation moves as well so yeah, yeah. Um, and is there has there been much innovation in this field of, of canopy um, jumping in terms of equipment or your techniques or is it very just intuitive do you all um, have you all just come across the techniques that you use um, just just by yourselves Jules is probably more qualified to speak on this, but certainly the if you haven't got the right equipment, then then you're just pissing into the wind, so to speak, yeah. a lot of the time. Um, yeah, the equipment's definitely changed in canopy formation in the last um, even ten, uh, yeah, twelve years since I started. Um, a lot of new canopies have come from um, some manufacturers around the world. Yeah. And also the, the leaders in each discipline, um, you know, we've had coaching from the French and from the Americans. They both have a very different style. Um, right. We um, soon got to the top or, or close to the top of our discipline um, worldwide um, from taking mainly American influence, but we are also... Um, Sort of steer, we'd, we'd, we'd watch the French and, and download their videos and actually look at their technique and, and sort of use, use that as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and, and sort of morph that into our own a little bit. Mm. Okay, so would you say the Australians have their own style now? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so that is something that you see when you go to these international uh, uh, competitions. You see that each nation have, have very different ways of achieving the same goal. Yeah, for sure. And you can see the influence they've had, um, for instance, the, um, the Dubai team, um, 
uh, were heavily influenced by the Americans and you could see that and we yeah. were heavily influenced by the French um, in the last few years and, and even other French teams were looking at our uh, performance. They're saying, ah, you've been, been trained by the French now. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's, it's definitely obvious when you change your technique. Um, but, you know, you're just doing what you do to, to improve your performance and whatever works at the time. And I guess all of that on the individuals as well, right? On your team. Yeah, for sure. So the team, you know, they have to um, not only uh, really get along with the coach, like you sort of pick your coach, not only on how good they are, but um, how well they gel with you, because that's really important that they can get their message across. Um, and, you know, and there's that respect and, and understanding, I guess, and, and just building that relationship with your coach is important. Yeah. And as a team, are you doing much on land training together? Like what do you do exercise classes together? Do you do formations on the ground together? Or is it mostly just yeah. video analysis and then trying to figure it out in the air? Uh, we warm up in the morning together um, and have a routine. Uh, and then we um, practice, we call it dirt diving, and we practice the formations on the ground um, before we... Um, take it into the air and then once we've landed we watch and analyze the video right yeah so you'll always have a, a videographer following you every time yeah even during training for sure it's so beneficial um yeah, yeah. okay interesting and are there are people of other disciplines here so we've got the the, the the canopy formation um what else have we got in the group um We've got formation um, skydiving. Speed, speed skydiving. Speed skydiving. Speed. All right. Well, let's talk about speed skydiving. What are the what are the variables of that that um, uh, competition? What do you need to, uh, get to achieve? So pretty much, it's our fastest vertical three second speed um, over a four thousand uh, seven thousand four hundred foot um, window. And pretty much just going head down, trying to get as vertical as possible, um, going. Yeah, arms by our side and then um, about 5,000 feet, we slow down, belly out and then uh, pitch from there. So, How do they determine where that distance is in the air? Um, so with us, that's one thing with the other guys, they do have the advantage of having that um, visualisation and the uh, videos of their jumps where with speed skydiving, we use a GPS um, tracker. So we pretty much only have the GPS data that can kind of show us our speeds and what we're doing um it shows us like vertical horizontal speed acceleration and all that kind of stuff so yeah. i've only ever had one person ever come with me speed skydiving and um yeah it's just one of those things that speeds we go are a bit faster than um, the belly flies so it's a bit more dangerous yeah and is there a particular um body type that tends to excel at speed skydiving um this is like um, this is something I'm definitely going to be um, doing a bit more research on and doing a bit more, um, yeah, getting a bit more data on that um, with Brent from Dakunu, um, just to kind of, because they don't have enough data on that at the moment. So yeah. I know a person that was um, Marco Hep. I met him at the World Cup, really cool guy. He's quite short, um, quite, quite a skinny guy, and he's re reaching 500 kilometres an hour, you know, so. Wow. Yeah. Um, I, I think for me, I, I find it's a lot more technique than anything else. Yeah, technique. But yeah, don't know. <laughs> Do you all need to be of a certain mass or the same weight um, when no. you're doing things? No, so there are a very range, a wide range of uh, weights in the sport. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think it's just one of those things we're just going to have to collect more data to find out whether it really does affect. But um, no, they don't have any weight classes or anything like that, no. Okay, interesting. I might chime in there. Um, I'm in the wingsuit uh, competition area. So similar to speed, one of our performance aspects is a speed run. Yeah. Um, so on body type... Of it's, it's funny because there's, unlike the speed guys where they basically just tuck everything in and go head first towards the ground, we've got our arms basically out to our sides. Yeah. So the, the heavier sort of guys have more mass um, per se, which you would think would make them go 100% um, faster. But with the arms out and our suits, we've actually got 
like there's a different aspect to it with the surface area um, equation and that equating to lift as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but when you look at the results, um, you've, you know, two of our top guys have, um, over the last few, um, few years have been quite different sort of uh, structures, one um, shorter and um, more mass driven and one sort of more tall and um, lanky. And they've both been sort of putting, they've, they've, I think they've both got their sort of favourites, but um, uh, they're, they're both kind of pretty close to each other. Okay. And I mean, with a wing suit, uh, yep. is your, does your wing basically go to the, the edge of your wrist or your arm? So your arms will dictate your, the wingspan of your suit? Uh, you don't have like yeah, if, if you've got a yeah if you've got a longer arm span then you've got a you've you've effectively got a bigger suit if you were to be wearing the same uh, suit by the same manufacturer yeah yeah okay all right but they're not specialized none of you have any sort of specialized uh, uh, equipment uh, the suits themselves come there there are there are a handful of manufacturers um, so they produce their race suits and then. People were making minor modifications to help um, reduce drag, like um, handle covers and, and the likes, um, and maybe altering leading edge um, stiffness and things. But they they tend the the actual design because they're quite intricate in how they're designed with um, with all the ribs um, placement and and the and the inlets and stuff. But the minor modifications, but on the whole, yeah, they kind of come as they are. Yeah. Okay. So that's interesting. So, and people of different masses, different sizes can almost compete in the same. Uh, Correct. Event. Yeah. But they, the, the problem with the extra, um, the, the other thing that complicates things, the increased wingspan, um, then basically gives you more drag as well. Yeah. Uh, it may give you more surface area, which is more potential for lift, but with that comes more drag. So it's about managing that and it's still quite new and people are still kind of figuring things out. So, yeah. Sorry, Jack, I interrupted you there. <laughs> That's all right. Because um, I was also looking at how, how uh, strength, like your own strength would have to uh, uh, play into that uh, based on based on your mass or potentially even your wingspan because you've got a larger wingspan, it's a larger moment for the forces to be acting on your arms. So uh, so if we were going back into, um, say, the, the, the speed uh, skydiving, that vertical skydiving, do you... Do you, or even in any of the disciplines, do you feel tired um, when you've actually pulled the shoot? Like, do you feel like you've had, had a workout or you've, uh, you've really worked your muscles to sustain those positions or, um, or whatnot? Uh, no, we only go for about 30 seconds, so it's pretty quick. <laughs> so you feel okay. How about the, the wingsuit then? Yeah, definitely. If you've done a, um, if you've done a, a, a sustained sort of, run uh then with sort of the time and the distance runs you can be getting up to 80 seconds worth of um 80 to 100 seconds worth of free fall um and if you're not pulling the if you're not pulling the shoot um fit out of breath then you definitely haven't gone hard enough i'm it's a shame a couple of the other guys aren't a few of the other guys aren't here because i'm quite new to this but the one thing i did notice was um because the suit sizes in wingsuit they start off really small um with small arm wings and then the race suits are really big and they generate, they, they pressurise a lot, um, a lot harder um, and take a lot more muscle to fly. And the big thing is, yeah, when you, when you are racing these things and trying to get the most out of them, uh, it's, yeah, you're definitely puffed by the time you, are, you come to pull the shoot. Okay. And, and given that, do you have uh, exercise regimes that you go through to condition yourselves for the... Yeah, like say, I'm 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 kind of this is the first year I've been into it, so um, I'm definitely after the competition that I just did, I'm, I'm a lot more. Uh, how do you say? I've, I've got a new respect for what needs to be done to to sort of get there. So yeah, I've I'm developing a new sort of regime, which is kind of been interrupted with the gyms all being closed. <laughs> But um, yeah, lateral pull down stuff, sort of lateral raise extension um, hold to build the stamina. Yeah, um, a lot of a lot of uh, sort of core based exercises as well. Yeah, um, yeah, but it's it's developing for me. Yeah. Okay. 
And um, I wanted to talk about injuries at some point, but first of all, I'd want to see what other disciplines we've got in the group and see uh, what variables play into to your competitions. So we've, we've got the vertical diving, we've got the canopy formation, we've got wingsuit. What else have we got? I do uh, free fly, or the uh, last competition I did was freestyle. So it's very, uh, at times, poised position. So you're holding a particular position in free fall, and other times you have to be extremely flexible mm -hmm. um, to show different orientations and movements. Um, so flexibility um, and core strength really play heavily into those areas, I feel. Yeah. Um, two lines of thought on the, you know, if you open up your parachute and if you're puffing and painting, um, two lines of thought. Mine, one was if, I, if I've opened up my parachute and I'm, I'm heavily breathing, it's like yeah, I've really been working hard. And years ago, I came across someone else in the sport and I told them this and I thought, oh, yeah, I really felt like I did a good jump. And he goes, well, you were putting too much into it. You shouldn't have to put so much into it. Yeah. We only do small movements to, to create big things. If you're putting too much effort into something, you're working too hard. You're over amping. Um, yeah. So you, you, you've gone past your peak performance point. You're actually over exertion yeah. uh, rather than, than just going through it. But it's also learning about those points <laughs> um, as uh, stepping stones and mile marks to up your ante on your training in, your, in your each discipline so so when you first started doing it were were there barriers to what you could do and did you identify what those barriers were and try to train towards them using a lot of the, a lot of the barriers were initially with uh, the the line of skydiving that i took was uh, reef line which was there, there'd been a little bit of this orientation and discipline going on, but not a great deal. So it was really new when I started in Australia. Yeah. Um, there was only a handful of people that were doing this. So everything was learning off videos that we saw from the States or from uh, extreme sports or ESPN, all that sort of stuff. So the learning process was extremely high. Yeah. Um, and we made a lot of mistakes because we were just going we didn't have coaches at that point. It was just literally learning off video, video um, of other yeah. people and trying to imitate what they were doing, mimic yeah. what they were doing and not really knowing the full purpose as to why. Um, yeah. So uh, for me, I ended up going overseas and, and training with these people and, and spending a lot of time and a lot of money and, and just going and jumping and learning a lot more and then bringing that back to Australia. So, yeah. But that was that was a, a fair while ago. So I guess that is that is that common with many of you. Have you learned most of your techniques through yes. having to watch videos and then just uh, mimic? A lot was actually I think even in the early days was you get the coaches coming in from other countries. So if we could get the top teams, like one of the performers, one of the athletes from those teams to come out and coach either a big event or you know. A, Back in the day, if, if you had the money in, in, in a team and a team could bring you out a coach, that was, that was quite a big thing where yeah. usually it was an event a coach and a whole heap of people had a chance to uh, listen and learn and, and gain a lot of information. Yeah. From you. And I guess because it is a sport that's, that I guess initially was so difficult to disseminate the information, that's why all these countries have their different styles because they've been able to maybe cultivate it. Uh, over over a certain amount of time yeah so uh, do you have a choreographed routine for freestyle um i i did for the last one that we we had um i'm not exactly a, a young player when i came into doing this particular performance so yeah. my idea was to keep it um maybe not so well fairly simple but try and do it as clean and and as well executed as possible um, yeah. because not having the, the, the full training regime or, or the flexibility to go and do a lot of the, the moves, trying to make what I did do look really clean. Yeah. Okay. All right. 
Um, and also just as a side note, do many of you have like similar backgrounds pre, um, pre skydiving? Like for instance, climbing seems like it would be something that would help with maybe a few of the maneuvers. I'm, I'm an avid climber. Um, but did you all come from different fields and then somehow go into skydiving from there or have you all come at it from completely different directions? I think you have the widest range of people from the widest range of uh, places. Yeah, definitely all different, I reckon. All right. Yeah. All right. So uh, any other disciplines in the group at the moment? Skydiving disciplines. Outside yep, of I'm in uh, formation skydiving. Yeah. Yep. So we fly um, in this orientation on our bellies. Okay. There is also a vertical formation skydiving, but um, I'm in this orientation. Mm -hmm. And so, what's what's the goal there? You're just trying. So to we make formations um, in 3D, spinning, rotating, or on level. Um, we try and make a number of points within 35 seconds. 35 seconds. Okay. How many would you have to maybe perform in 35 seconds? many as you can that's the goal <laughs> yeah. okay. all right so then you need to be able to be quite maneuverable in the air yeah it's very dynamic so from the time we exit we're working really hard and then we get to an altitude where we would separate and then open our parachute similar to the others okay right and and do you perform those maneuvers on the ground first Yes, we do lots of preparation on the ground. We fly in the wind tunnel as well to practice our manoeuvres. Oh, right. Yeah, that would be, a, ideally, that would be um, a big proportion of our training as well as the sky. And how many people would be typically be in a group? Um, for our team, it's four. Sometimes it's eight, um, plus the cameraman. Okay. Does the cameraman's position sometimes uh, have any effect over your... Uh over the points that you can get awarded? Yes, <laughs> if they're really bad, then we don't get many points. Okay. But we don't have very, we have amazing camera people in our okay. discipline, yeah. And they'll move around where they need to be in order to, if they're good, to show, show clean points. And so for in, if you're uh, going to an international competition, do you bring your own cameraman or is this? Yes, absolutely. They're a permanent member of the team, yeah. Wow. They're very important. Any cameramen in the group? No, well, sometimes, because I imagine you'd need to be very maneuverable, right? You'd need to, do you need to span a much larger area to, to um, capture the information or are you trying to keep in a constant spot the whole time? Um, you're actually observing what the team are doing and how they're flying because you're trying to keep a frame. Yeah, that's um, you want to keep them all um, in the frame. And that it, depending on the, the the formations that they're forming sometimes they're long and they're moving around so that as it's moving sometimes they're drifting in the sky so we're repositioning coming in closer or further away to, to keep them in frame if it's a very long extended formation yeah um, okay so you're constantly working as well to to keep them in frame and not fall on top of them or get them to a point where they're coming underneath you and you get their their verbal which can yeah. That yeah, happens really you close. Fallen on them before? Sorry? You've fallen on top of them before? Um, not really fallen on top of them, but just got sucked onto them on exit and, and like had to try and push off. Um, that was in the very early days of doing camera. So yeah. that didn't happen yes. very often, thank goodness. <laughs> I imagine when you change your direction, it might be somewhat like you know being on a bike or a motorcycle where if you you know orient your head in a certain direction do you tend to have your body turn in that way as well but for you as the cameraman sometimes you might need to be directing your your camera to a different direction as, as your the orientation that you're you're, you're falling or mm. you is that something that you have to account for well you, you're trying to set the formations here you're trying to set up as close to as possible so you're just hitting the edge of the verbal yeah. which is all the diffused air coming off them. Um, so you're trying to stay as close to that area as possible um, and keep them all in frame because that's, that's your job. You're supposed to be getting that clear separation on film so the judges can score. Um, yeah. If you're in the wrong spot or you're too far back over here, the line of sight isn't um, 
giving the true reading of what the team's actually doing. And if the judges can't see it, they won't score it. Oh, wow. They'll score accordingly. <laughs> so it's a lot on the cinematographer then. All right. Uh, so before I get into injury, other, other disciplines outside of the formation, the freestyle, the canopy, the speed, the wingsuit. Do we have anything else or is this, does that cover everybody in here? Um, we, there are a couple of other uh, disciplines, but currently there's no one here. Um, so there's canopy piloting where they're trying to fly their parachute as fast as they can. Um, through okay. on the on the ground, so that yeah. yeah, they're actually yeah, so they jump out <clears throat> at about five thousand feet. Um, they open their parachute, and they're very high performance parachutes. They can go over hundred k's an hour across yeah. the ground. Um, yeah. So they do a manoeuvre at a um, at about the last thousand feet to make their canopy go as fast as it can, and then they have to navigate through. Um, there's three different courses over the pond. Um, there's speed to go as fast as you can in a carving lane. Um, yeah. distance to go as fast as they can through um, entry gate or oh, sorry as far they go through entry gates that are five foot high um, and then they try and go as far as they can um, yeah. and then zone accuracy where they drag their feet in the water and then land in a target box a series of target boxes um, and you know the, the the one in the center is the most points yeah. um, and then there's classic accuracy where they've got a different parachute again and they're trying to land on an inflatable tuffet and, and there's actually a 16 centimetre round disc that they're trying to get right in the centre of that. So they're probably the only people who are trying to score as less as possible because a zero, like he's landing right in the centre. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. All right. So... Uh, and yeah, sorry. And then there's vertical. Oh, then there's vertical formation skydiving, but the, none of those guys are currently in this session. Um, I think a lot of people are working, so I'm recording this now for them to watch afterwards. And hopefully, those guys will watch this throughout the week and come with some questions for next week, maybe. Yeah, that'd be good. Um, yeah, sorry, guys. I I just joined about um, five or six minutes ago. So um, there's Jason here from wingsuiting. Hey, Jason. Um, Another wingsuiter. Yeah. I'm not sure what you covered with wingsuiting already. If you need answers or anything, uh, yeah. Questions. Tom, Tom, Tom gave some info on wingsuiting already. Thanks, Jase. Yeah. Cool. Um. So I, I guess in everyone that's here, you all tend to land with quite low velocity. Is that right? Um. You all tend to to pull up before you land, and you just almost just land on your feet. You don't have to do that. that rolling land or anything like that is that is that true of you all or even ideally to decelerate that's how we try to you try to land yep try to do a tippy toe landing on every jump yeah okay. tippy toe landing because that was one thing i did look into there was slight differences in how different countries train at least their troops to land um whether it's a flat foot or a tippy toe land or just you, you land into a squat which i think is what the russian military do um, but yeah, so you're all taught to land in a specific way. And I guess that wouldn't always happen based off say the wind that might be around during the day and uh, I don't know the conditions, but have any of you um, had landing injuries before? Um, at all? Or have the landing yeah. been nice and consistent and comfortable? I, I know I've broken several bones. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then, but I know people. I'm oh, sorry, Jules. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yes. Have any of you had landing injuries? Yes. Yes. So it is a common. Probably most have. Mm. Ankles are a common landing injury. Probably the most common. I've done an ankle before. We're also active in weather. So yes. it can have a significant impact if it's very, very hot, you get a lot of thermals, if it's very windy or the wind comes up, if there's a storm coming through, um, you know, there are factors out there that you try and control, but sometimes you can't, and other times it's just human error. Okay. All right. And you always tend to try to land on your feet and you're not trying to do a sort of a sliding land? It depends on the conditions and it depends if you're holding an injury already. Um, quite often people with landing, uh, you know, um, ankles that they're trying to nurse or, or, or leg injuries would try to go for more of a sliding landing. Yeah. If they can't run it out. 
um, when, mm. when the wind conditions don't allow for that. So if, if there's not a lot of wind, you're going wind, fast. It feels a bit nicer. Yeah. A bit more, bit more pressure on depends the Depends on the... Mm. Also depends on the terrain where you're landing, yeah. if it allows for a slide landing or not. Okay, so no two landings are ever the same. You're always that you needed to have a variety of probably motor patterns in your mind in in how to land based off pretty much that split second and how the how the variables might change before you come into contact with the ground. Is yes. that right? Mm. Yeah. And do you do much landing training then? any jump landing from different directions coming from different rotations do you there's op there's opportunities for canopy courses for landing canopy courses that yeah. um i mean as us as competitors um in all our various disciplines once again none of us are really focusing on i mean we're focusing on a good landing for every single jump so that we don't injure ourselves to go to the next jump yeah yeah um and and you can um yeah, there, there are canopy coaches out there who teach you how to land better, video your landings and critique them to land better, to prevent injury. Mm. Yeah, okay. Well, that's good. It's good that there are some processes in place there. With working in the industry, it's always critiquing landing um, with and you want to be able to get to the next one for sure. So you, you're always assessing, constantly assessing every time you're jumping and yeah. landing, what you're doing, how you're doing, what can I do better? Mm -hmm. um, every jump because yeah I mean I looked into the to the literature and it said about 80% of all parachuting injuries would come from the landing and a lot of it is accounting from because of poor landing technique um, and uh, it's always hard to have a, a perfect landing technique when the variables change on you um, in that, that small amount of time when you're about to touch the ground but I guess landing technique just like that we're seeing in, in in other sports like AFL and soccer, where they're having to land, um, uh, trying to train people to land, uh, is is something that can really be beneficial in reducing injuries. Um, so, if you are doing certain conditioning programs, just just those landing exercises might be something, um, you know, at, at lower um, lower forces, just jumping off small boxes could be something that could be beneficial because when I looked into it, like some, but it's a lot of it's military data, but they're, they're landing at sometimes 8.4 times body weight, 11 uh, times, uh, 11 times body weight on a flat foot. Um, but I, I believe military parachutes probably have a much smaller canopy. So they're, they're coming at the ground a lot quicker. Um, I think with that too, it's the, the canopy, but also the potential weight that each um, paratrooper is jumping with in that circumstance. Um, yeah. if, they're, if they're loaded up with full kit, um, they could be carrying 110 plus, including their own body weight, 110 kilo or, or more. Like kit alone could be 60 kilo. Yeah. So they're definitely coming down a lot more force. Um, so yeah, maybe people here might be a bit more interested in, um, you know, talking about other, you know, not necessarily landing injuries, but in each discipline, um, you know, there's certain, I know, I know for, um, canopy formation, it'd be more, um, shoulder injuries and, um, and a hip in injury, um, just from, um, the way that we manoeuvre, you know, so maybe... Yeah. Um, some exercises or something on, you know, preventing injuries to strengthen and condition. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about some injuries then. So have anyone had um, injuries from just the actual, what sustained postures that you, you need to be able to maintain in the air? Anyone have any stories they could talk about? Shoulder dislocations I would throw into the mix. Okay. Was it from the parachute, uh, you no. know? The... No, so it's shoulder dislocation and free fall. So I suppose there might have been an inherent weakness. Yeah. Shoulders can be a, a sort of a regular challenge for people. Um, yeah. So often the free fall side of things like Kate and wrist. Um, and I think, you know, initially it was definitely a weakness. Mm -hmm. And then that got um, challenged with extensions at, at speed and with, um, 
you know, momentum or weight or tension, torque, whatever the right expression is. Yeah. Um, but um, also people who might have had a poor landing or something then go back into free fall and find that their, you know, their shoulder is weak. So um, shoulders can be can be a challenge. Um, yeah. What else from a free fall point of view? or risk sort of injuries that we tend to see. We, we get quite a few injuries now in the tunnel, for example, if people are flying fast and flying hard, they might bump themselves against the wall, but that's not skydiving. That's actually, you know, the technical training in the wind tunnel. Um, yeah, yeah. But in free fall, it tends to be more contact. So if you're going fast and going hard, um, you know, somebody might, might hit you. Um, concussion is a challenge. So you're working in yeah. proximity at speed with a lot of momentum. So knees on heads can be fairly uh, regular occurrence. Those are the types of things I can think of. Yeah. Because go, well, going back into the shoulder, I imagine, I mean, you're in this position, which is like a maximally closed pack position for the shoulder. This is a position for, in, in many sports, a position. No, not, where... not really, no. Um, so the, the okay. shoulder position of the shoulder being, or the arm being behind your shoulder is not how we fly, because you need to be able to pick up grip. So your hands are in front of you. Okay. And this is actually giving you a fantastic demonstration. So, <laughs> so your hands are in front of you. So if you, sorry, I'm not in a position to switch my video on, but if, if you, if you extend your arm in that situation and you have pressure on the inside of the shoulder and then you get momentum or you're getting pulled, then, then there can be quite a, a strain on the shoulder. Okay. All right. So, so you are air. having to resist the air in this position here. You're resisting the air, but it's mostly on the front of your shoulders, and then obviously, yep, the pressure on the the, the insides of your your arms. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. but the, the the main issue comes from maybe picking up a grip that has tension on it, or momentum, or or power attached to it that isn't being hasn't been managed for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, and then you get pulled. So it's a, it, it's more of a sort of a dynamic. I think Kate used that word quite well. Dynamic experience. Okay, not so much that static holding. Because I was thinking with, with this position, you're having to forcefully internally rotate to keep your arms here, and the air is, is forcing you into external rotation. So you're needing to have, make sure that these internal rotating muscles, which in this position, they're not very strong. So um, it, it tends to come more from the shoulder blades. So if you push your shoulder blades down and you think about lifting your, your chest and your sternum, then that's where you're going to get the stability from. Okay. We we get a lot of um, like tight pecs and. Oh, so in like a hollow. Yeah. From a lot of working on the front, for the, those of us who fly on our bellies, but to kind of counter and and so. Otherwise, I think we get a bit of a. An over overworking of the front, and people get a lot of um, rotator cuff injury. Yeah, rotator cuff injuries. Yeah. So with with your training, you're doing a lot of uh, you know I, you were saying how you're doing sort of pressing and pulling type movements, um, but uh, are you doing a lot of unilateral stuff? Because this is, seems to be a problem, especially with a lot of yeah. other athletes. Yeah, well. I have every TheraBand imaginable. Okay. <laughs> yep. Every color of the rainbow. Yeah. So it's important when you are doing resistance training to not just be doing the, the bilateral stuff, which, you know, gets a lot of uh, recruitment of the muscles. It makes them very strong, but also be doing a lot of unilateral stuff because it uses a lot more of the stability, the stability muscles within the movement. Um, so if you are doing a pull down or a press, try to do a bit more unilateral stuff where you're actually not moving just in a, in a single plane um, because that can recruit um, not just those larger muscles, the force producing muscles, but also those small stability muscles. So uh, if you are doing any weight training, that is always something that you should be putting in there. Um, unilateral exercises, both for legs and, and arms. Um, but but going back into in, into the uh, the position itself, so in a sort of a, a protracted position, you're trying to push your uh, your shoulders forwards against the wind resistance. Um, but then you're also in an, an extended position. What's what's your back uh, like in that free falling position? Well, 
So quite um, like a Superman type um, exercise in the sky. Are you maximally extending basically as far as you can go back? No, not not a maximum arch. We like ideally we try to fly a little bit flat because it gives you range to go faster or slower yeah. to yeah. kind of change. But very generally speaking, you'd say we we yeah. Yeah, generally. I'll see if I can show, like. Give us an example. Okay. <laughs> so an arch position. Great. That was a good, good demonstration. <laughs> and from, because another thing I was thinking about is, is the maneuverability of your, of your trunk. Um, because if, if you've got uh, movement of your trunk, then that will also dictate how much, um, how much strain is being put on the shoulders. So uh, do you all have quite good mobility in terms of rotation? So if you are all sitting on, the, on a chair right now, how far can you actually rotate your trunk in one direction versus the other? Are you all very mobile? So keeping your pelvis as stable, how far can you turn those torsos around? So we have quite a bit of stability, yeah. I think um, the core strength is a huge one for all of the disciplines in skydiving. I think, um, and I don't know, maybe being able to, to engage that while you do other exercises is important. Yeah, very much so. I mean, having that range of motion is important, but also being able to stabilize that range of motion. So. If I'm trying to zoom out of things like the shoulder, which I'm sure, you know, bear a lot of forces, um, having musculature around your trunk to also dissipate load and stabilize is, is quite important. So, uh, you know, in, in strength and conditioning and in physio, we are trying to go away from the single looking at the one joint, but then looking at how all of these other muscles play into it. So like looking at these muscle chains. So, um, yeah, core stability, like you said, I think is, is probably a very uh, important factor here. Um, because I guess even in the extended position, I'm not sure how much trunk rotation you have there. Um, the reason why you can hold a cat upside down and drop it and the cat can orient themselves right way up is they can rotate their trunk on their pelvis about, you know, 180 degrees or even further. They can change that axis and then change that axis and then, and then land on their, on their paws. Uh, but we don't have as much of that rotation. Um, so core strength, are you doing much core strength training? And, and if you are, it, what kind of things would you be doing? Cause I hope it isn't just isolated core strength stuff. I hope it's stuff that involves the upper and the lower extremity. Can anyone comment? Our, on our, our core uh, strength training is, is, intense and holistic and there's a few pilates instructors in the room and all that kind of stuff i think you'll find that we're reasonably sophisticated in terms of our core strength training perfect <laughs> that's good and is it all a regular program that you'd all um you know be participating in throughout the year and leading up into competition it's pretty much down to any individual to be managing that themselves so everybody would just be doing whatever they need to do um to be fit and strong for their own competitions yeah and do you think there's a scope for the australian um parachuting association to to have some sort of program for all the athletes do you think that'd be beneficial or do you all prefer to have your own um way to go about it we all have so many personal unique challenges dan um i'm I'm not sure that one program would be a fit for all. No, it really is. <laughs> all right, so have there been any back injuries given the extended position that you be, you're in? How about for, wing, for wingsuit flight? Are you also in an extended position there? Yeah. We are, but it's not really in, it's, it's not really on your back. It's, um, oh, where's that noise coming from? Um, yeah, there's not a, not a lot of strain on your back. It's a, a lot of strain on your shoulders, um, your legs as well. At the end of the day, 
my quads and my calves are absolutely caned. Yeah. Um, yeah. But not nearly, not nearly your back. Yes. Yeah. Not so much your back. So it seems to be shoulders is, is a popular thing. Um, so if, if there are some other Pilates instructors, what kind of core exercises would you be doing? Um, so we can, uh, we can share it with the group. Um, so core exercises and also things that for the shoulder, I'd be interested to see what exercises you find good, at least for the free falling um, aspect of skydiving. I think um, one that seems to be coming up in my mind that I've been trying to do when I remember it is um, the extended planking time. So when you're on your, on your elbows and your forearms um, and just trying to support your, your body weight holding that position but then also side each side as well um and trying to build up that time that you can hold that position for and try and get that core strength happening into yeah. it. that's only one of i'm sure many techniques yeah i mean planks crawling bear crawls anything like that that have to make mu muscles connect to one another through chains those things would be ideal um yeah you know, planking, different variations of planking, planking on your hands and then seeing how far you can get those hands out. And so you're be doing a, a star position and, you know, challenging to see how far you can get the star out of the position. Things like that um, would be perfect for you because they would, they would target where the weaknesses in these chains would be. And usually shoulders would be a, a point of uh, weakness there. One thing I would like to ask you is um, if you're catching with, like catching something moving at force with your arm extended, that's a kind of a very easy way to injure your shoulder. Yeah. If something's coming at you at a distance. I think and here. Kind of, um, what can you do to, yeah, out in front or out anywhere around above you, but at extension? What could you do to strengthen your shoulder? Sorry, you cut out a little bit at the end, but you're asking... Uh, what you might be able to do to strengthen your shoulder to prevent those kinds of injuries? Yeah, yeah, so that's a good question. So that's, they're kind of dynamic uh, movements in, in positions of elongation. So uh, where the, the ball and socket joint, um, it's it, the muscles are quite stretched over the joint and they they need to be able to rotate the joint in a certain position to orient your shoulder to actually catch the object but also to be able to perform uh um to perform stability you know um keeping that traction so the best way to do it is is basically exercises that that get your brain and your muscles used to those movements so things like throwing a tennis ball um, or sometimes something heavier against a wall and then trying to catch it out there and going from here to here. So it's not so much just uh, strengthening in this position, which is a good sort of isolated thing to do, which you could do with TheraBands in terms of, you know, if, if you're pulling a TheraBand down, you're keeping your shoulder down and you're trying to draw circles, you're trying to do alphabets in those positions. But th that'd be like a, a lower level, but just trying to get those throws because it means you're, you're throwing, you're catching in slightly different degrees and you're just getting the, the muscles to respond to, you know, variance in that position. So things like that, and you'd be aiming for uh, higher repetitions. So like trying to do uh, maybe 40 catch throws with one arm, then try to do 40 with the other arm. It'll probably all probably be falling all over the place on that one. Um, and, then, and then trying to do maybe uh, three sets of those and you'll find that you'll start to fail quite towards the end um, in terms of your ability to reposition because uh, as the muscles get more tired, you wouldn't be able to reposition as much because they won't be as, as responsive. So yeah, 30 on each side times three. I'd, I'd start with something very light like a tennis ball, but you'd want to be trying to aim to catch, almost letting the ball go beyond your head and then trying to catch it. So, I used to do that for a bit for, um, for volleyballers, but they'd be using the, the, a larger ball. Um, so you'd always want to be breaking it down. Uh, so you'd probably just want to be strengthening the muscles in that position. So maybe a TheraBand pull 
and do the alphabet with your hand. Uh, make sure that's comfortable. And that will be, the band will be providing a traction force and the muscles are having to be both doing compression and reposition. Um, and then maybe some throwing exercises. What exercises have you already been doing for, uh, for sort of that similar position? Or issues involved in that? I don't think I've ever really isolated that movement before. Um, it's always been a bit of a concern for me because I've had previous shoulder injuries. With yeah, the, okay. with the catching. So, yeah. um, Have you had dislocations yourself as well? No, and undiagnosed, so I don't know. I sometimes wonder if it comes a bit from the neck, the connection with the neck, though. I mean, you look at um, Kate over there, you know, stretching her neck, and I think we... I don't know if um, a lot of people have issues with their necks as well from maybe parachute openings and things like that. We can get quite quite a lot of um, jolt through our necks and how that might connect to our um, shoulders as well. I'm not sure. Yeah, so it, it'll definitely, uh, it'll change the position of your scapula because a lot of the muscles attaching from your scapula uh, run right up to your skull and to your, your neck, your cervical spine. So your, your head will influence your shoulder blade, which will also influence your shoulder. So um, have anyone, when you're falling, for example, can someone give me an example of where your neck is positioned? Are you in an extended position as you're falling? You're looking in front of you to the, Horizon, you're not looking down. It's different from for all the disciplines. Um, those of us that fly in our belly are looking in front, ahead. Um, those of us that fly vertical, I don't know where they're looking, at each other. <laughs> yeah, it's probably got a bit more neutral spine. Yeah. Um, and then uh, does everyone assume the same position when the parachute opens? Pretty much. No. Wing sitting, we're, we're, we don't. But that's fine. You're slightly different. And Sometimes with, with vertical, depending on what you're doing, you're actually looking out to the side, um, seeing your, either the person you're jumping with or looking for something on the horizon if you've got to do specific turns. Yeah. To your, your, um, you have sustained positions in rotation. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that would, that would definitely influence the shoulder. Um, has anyone had any neck injuries from the actual parachute opening phase? Because I guess you're going, it's almost like a whiplash, right? The parachute yeah. is, is stabilising the thorax C and then all C of your seven. other extremities are still going forwards. So C C7 snap. Oh, yeah. Have you had a break of C7? Yeah. Gosh. It's just, just whiplash injury. Yeah. Wow. Anybody else had neck injuries? Maybe not so much injuries, but definitely um, pinches, so to speak. Uh, like certain fast opening canopy um, or you're looking for something and the canopy then decides to, to snap open and you, you've got your head pitched up looking at the canopy or looking yeah. out or something, you can get excessive movement from that opening shock. Yeah, because yeah, a lot of my supervisors um, uh, at UC, they're doing a lot of work on cervical spines in uh, fighter pilots and all of the Gs they're having to do as well. Uh, but the fighter pilots, they wear helmets, which you know increases the mass of their head. Do any of you wear helmets? Or every, everyone wear helmets? I think yeah. pretty much everyone in competition wears a helmet. Yeah, okay. in all the disciplines. Probably the I think our helmets may be light. slightly light, lighter than the helmets that the fighter pilots would wear. Yeah, <laughs> very lightweight. Cameraman, um, back in the day, cameramen could be wearing a camera helmet, depending on how many cameras they put on. Um, my regular helmet was three kilos or over. Um, okay. I've heard of some people wearing helmets. Uh, up to 10 kilos. Gosh. I mean, but even still, three kilos um, is, is still quite a bit of mass to still have on your head because your, your head is basically a popsicle. It's, it's a big, heavy mass 
on term, you know, on the smallest part of your spine, your cervical spine. So you do have quite a lot of muscles around your neck to try to stabilize, but they're having to work very hard to, to decelerate a head that's almost falling at terminal velocity. I mean, sometimes when you, uh, I don't know if you ever reach terminal velocity, maybe the speed skydivers do. Oh, um, we, 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 all, we all get there in one form or another. Okay, um, yeah. So that's, that's a lot of forces that your neck muscles, particularly, so your neck, it goes, when you fall, you go into maybe this position and that position. So that's upper cervical extension and lower cervical flexion. So you'd want muscles that can stabilize the upper cervical bit into, into there, but you'd also obviously want your massive extensors of your neck to prevent any of that uh, uh, crushing movement. So going back into the C7, was that, did you feel that was because of a forced extension or the forced flexion part? Or is that hard, too hard to determine because it was so quickly, it happened so quickly? I think that was, was that Melissa? Yeah. Um, you mean the injury? Yeah. Um, it, was, it was literally just um, stopping quickly. So there was a, that was, I had a, a, a malfunction in the parachute and it, um, it, it basically was like um, whiplash on a car. So yeah. I don't know whether it's extension or whatever, but I think it was everything all at once. Yeah, yeah. Most likely it would have been a sort of a flexion type injury. Yeah. And uh, I mean, if I'm going to just draw information from other sports, we do get a lot of whiplash uh, injury, um, like, like rugby. Um, and... Um, American football does a lot on, on whiplash and concussions. Um, they're doing a lot more neck strengthening exercises these days. Um, so extension, extension movements. Um, uh, I guess the Pilates people, you'd know a, a bit about your deep neck flexor exercises, like doing neck sit-ups. Um, so that's trying to strengthen these very deep neck muscles. Do you do much of that for your strength and conditioning, Pilates people? Um, maybe as a secondary benefit, yeah, because we do lots of curling motion, so it would, it would happen, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because those, those neck muscles, although they do do flexion, they, they are more stabilizers in the neck. They run really, really close to the cervical spine or the vertebral bodies at the, at the front. Uh, so uh, having those deep neck flexor muscles, and maybe I'll show you just uh, the, the neck sit-up exercise. Um, yeah, it's good for, for endurance. Um, that is a really good stabilizer and compressor of the cervical spine when it has to go into that forced extension. So, I mean, I'll show you so some. Then, sorry, Dan. So then through those deep muscles, then would that also provide support in an extension for the back of the neck? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, uh, it, it, it maintains its form. It's like a core of the neck, you could say, right? So it won't be the, the big muscle that prevents, um, prevents that increased flexion that would happen as, as the, the, the pack pulls you, um, but it would actually help stabilize the front of the neck. Um, so it's, again, something we've been doing a lot with, with rugby players where they think they just need to do these big, strong extension movements to prevent their head from going forwards, but really they need to be doing these smaller flexion movements um, to get those strap muscles strong those longus coli and capitis muscles. I'll show you, I'll see if I can give you an example of the old neck sit up exercise. With all of my biomechanics labs, I'm never sitting down talking to people. I'm always uh, trying to demonstrate things. So, um, you don't want to be just lifting your head like this. This uses these larger muscles um, that, that are really quite uh, close to the skin. Uh, we're trying to focus on deep muscles that lie very close to the actual neck itself or the cervical spine. So what you want to be doing is trying to tuck your chin, right? So it's like you're trying to make yourself have a double chin. Uh, maybe go all the way down, tuck it as far down as you can and then take it up just a little bit because you don't want to be over contracting too much. And then you want to see if you can keep that neck position and lift your head. Just enough so maybe you can slide a finger underneath. But you want to feel that position and feel how heavy your head is in that position. 
Now, you want to see if you can hold that for maybe 30 seconds. All right, we're not doing heavy reps. I'm not going to get you to load up your head with any more weight. I mean, maybe if you've got your helmet, you could see if you could do it with that, if you can do it without the helmet. But being able to hold that for 30 seconds is sometimes harder than it looks. And if it is particularly hard for you, potentially those muscles might not be super strong. And if they're not, they might not be there for you during that whiplash movement. So that's a good exercise that we were getting rugby players to do with these massive necks. You can think they'd be able to do it quite easily, but some of them are struggling quite a bit. So I'd, I'd recommend everyone try to give a, a 30 second challenge a go at some point of the neck sit up. So again, it's a double chin, chin tuck as far down as you can, but then try to release it just a little bit so you're not over flexing. And then you lift your head up just enough to fit a finger underneath of the back of your skull. Um, so that's a good stabilizer for the neck, but I understand that you have to be able to, you know, uh, rotate your neck as well. But I imagine you're always, uh, you're always uh, deploying the parachute when you're in a pretty centralized position. You would deploy it here or here. Yep. So you'd... Sometimes we might be looking right or left because we're looking to make sure that we're away from other people while we're doing it. But um, okay. generally, we, I guess we should be looking forward. Should be looking forward. Okay. So that, that could lead me into a, a lovely little progression to our little chin tuck exercise. If you could try to do your chin tuck exercise and then gently rotate to one side, right? A lot more muscles are having to work particularly on one side there um, and then see if you can hold that for maybe 20 seconds. It's probably going to be too difficult to find that 30 seconds. But slight orientations of your neck in a, in a sustained position. And I mean, I can give you progressions for days, but even holding that position and even just saying no for 30 seconds, that's, that's bloody difficult. But great stabilizers for the neck. Although it looks strange because it looks like we're doing a flexion exercise for what would be an extension injury, it's a great stabilizer. Now the extension injuries, are, you know, the extensor muscles like your traps, uh, splenius muscles, they can all be, be done in, uh, you know, in lying on uh, or being in a, in a four point and going from a flex position to a fully extended position. So doing some nice extension movements with gravity acting down on you. Um, they can be loaded um, with, with very light therabands. If you have your, your therabands in your, in your hands in a, in a, um, in a four point position, but I, I wouldn't load that too much. You'd want to be very comfortable doing at least, you know, 30 repetitions without any load. Um, is neck strengthening something that uh, has, has been approached much in any of your fields? No? I guess, uh, and, and how, how common would it be uh, as an injury for, for skydivers? Or is it really mostly the, the ankles or the landing based things in the shoulders? I don't think it's a particularly common injury per se, but I do think we we get a fair bit of stress put on it. And yeah. I um, I'm I was just curious to the connections because shoulder injuries are so common. How much um, that might contribute to to the neck? Yeah, yeah. Or the or the other way around. Yeah, how much the neck kind of the trauma on the neck contributes to the shoulder injuries and, and yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, another aspect of that is not just musculoskeletal injuries. So it's not just uh, injuries to the joints and the muscles themselves. If you're in sort of this position and your heads are in certain rotated positions, you can put slightly more tension on, on the, the nervous system because you know, the nerves that do come out of your neck and form this brachial plexus and come into your arms you know, these type movements, these type movements, those movements are 
movements that we would do in clinic to actually put tension on different strands of, of that nervous system. So making sure that you do have um, pretty good neural mobility, as, as some people call it, um, could also help in this environment. So when you are going through large ranges of motion in those positions, the nerves aren't the structures taking up that, uh, that slack because you know, nerves don't stretch. And if they do stretch, then they damage, right? So neural mobility is always something that they can do and Pilates is great at, at doing those kind of things. So, uh, you know, the old nerve stretch where you've got your hand forwards, you're bringing it out, you bring your shoulder down and you're really trying to extend your wrist, right? Almost like you're trying to give someone a high five to the side of you, but your fingers are facing down. You might already feel a bit of a pull from the front of your palm up into your, your shoulder and your, your neck. But if you were to hold that position and then slowly rotate your head to the, or tilt your head to the other side and you feel that pull increase, that is, that is neurogenic. That's the nerves being pulled and you're feeling this long, uh, uh, this, this long. Which way are you, is your hand facing? Sorry, I can't see it. Oh, my hand is, is, my palm here is facing away from me and my fingers are pointing down. Yeah. So I'm only doing it on one side at the moment, but I could do it on both sides where I keep my shoulders down I really bring them away from each other. I'm bringing my palms down. And then I'd very, very gently rock my hand side to side and feel that as I tilt my head, the opposite direction feels that slight tug. Now, if you do that too much, sometimes you might feel your fingers get a little bit pins and needlesy. So you'd want to bring yourself out of that position. I would say you'd only do like two or three tilts each side. Get yourself out of that position, shake your arms around, maybe do some nice like rotations with your arms over your shoulders, loosen it a little bit, and then go back into that position of stretch. Maybe two each side, moving super duper slow with your arm, with your head, just till you feel that tug, not any further and then shake it out, right? That does help with what we call neural mobility. Um, we're not actually making them the nerves stretch any further. We're just getting them used to moving through their pathways. Um, and if they're used to moving there through their pathways in that extended position um, on a regular basis, then when you are in this position and this kind of stuff happens, those nerves are less likely to get that particular strain that just overstretches them, which is where a lot of neck and, and, and arm issues can, can come from. Um, hey, Dan, well, on that vein then, is there anything that we could do then? I guess we all kind of need to have good vision as well in all orientations, whether we're under canopy. Um, in particular, I find when I'm flying in that orientation, I need to kind of look behind me or maybe even above me and below me. So. I think that can sometimes give me quite a crook neck. Is there anything I could do for that? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, again, from, from a neuro, neurological perspective, um, having this position and then not just doing a side tilt, but also trying to like reach your chin up to the opposite side and then down, right? So you'd just be straining them in a different direction, but um, that's from a nerve perspective, but also from just the joint perspective of your actual neck and then the muscles around it. Um, yeah, any, have you done any exercises with your towel before? Uh, having a towel behind your neck, pushing against it and then doing your rotations? No, um, no, my physio has made me do something similar in the past, but it's more like the chin tuck that you showed us. Chin tuck, yeah. All right, well, I don't have a towel, but I've got a, a sort of a rope here. Um, sometimes this can be good for um, upper neck um, stability and, and mobility. And it's just a simple sitting one. It's, you get a towel, something you see usually pretty thick, and you just put it around the base of your neck, right? And you're just applying a slight pulling forwards and a downward force, just so you're feeling the, the, um, the bottom part of your neck being stabilized. And from there, you can just rotate over the towel in one direction and rotate over the towel in the other direction. So you're looking up and over, 
right? Up and over. And what that's doing is it's trying to, it's moving the joints, but it's also trying to inhibit. Usually if you just put a, you know, put a force down on a muscle, you tend to inhibit those muscles to some degree. It's inhibiting those traps, the trapezius muscles, massive force producers, and it's trying to get these smaller neck muscles um, really just contracting and doing that movement. So it's good for both joint mobility and, and the um, activation of those what we call suboccipital muscles. Those very small muscles that have to do just these very small neck movements, which can still be quite uh, important for stability. So people that do tend to get like this neck soreness, um, sometimes it's because those smaller suboccipital muscles aren't quite doing their job in holding up, which is a massive mass. The axis of your head is here. That's why when you fall asleep in a plane, your head falls forwards. So all day, these guys behind are having to basically hold and pull to make sure your head's not falling down all the time. So even people sitting at the computer can get them sore, but I'm sure people that are putting a lot more stresses through their neck, you'd feel it a lot more. So does that sort of answer the question? Cool. Yeah. I mean, I can go on forever about exercises, but I'd want them to be specific to you and things that, you know, might be able to improve uh, your ability to, to do what you do and reduce the injuries. Um, so, yeah, shoulders, necks, ankles, best to... Uh, <laughs> do you ever tape ankles, by the way? That's one, that's one thing I was always interested in. If you've had an ankle sprain or an in injury, have you ever get it, got it taped for, for other jumps? Yeah. Um. Yeah, yeah, sometimes just to prevent further injury. Yep. Outside of jumping, I sprained my ankle and um, end up using one of the ankle wraps rather than getting it taped, um, which I, I found good. Yeah. For that, that base support. Um, still waiting and letting, trying to let the ankle heal and naturally as well, but having to go back and work. Yeah, that's ideal. Great. Um, so, any other questions? Because I guess from a biomechanical perspective, which is, you know, uh, sort of a newer profession of mine since my PhD, really the ways that biomechanics affects you is more of this movement analysis. So really looking at how you're doing the skydiving, comparing it to those who do it the best in the world and seeing what you can do to, um, to do that, but also um, has, has an effect over your equipment. Um, but yeah, I think probably the, the physiotherapy point of view and the resilience to, to um, future injury is something that I think is good for every athlete and probably in your field is something that's just underdeveloped. So are there other questions. Uh, well, for sure. For me, um, I guess people you've talked about shoulder and neck. Um, I know for me, I have had more lower, like I use my legs a lot, my quads, um, and have had sort of lower hip um, or, or hip pain um, from from my, from practicing my discipline. And I think Jason also mentioned he uses his quads a lot in wingsuiting. So maybe some strength and conditioning exercises for better mobility. So well, I'll show you, like for me, it's, um, I'm doing a lot of this sort of motion and, and, and reaching yeah. with my leg, um, but also I'm having a lot of weight, you know, hanging off of my legs and getting pulled yeah. for extended periods of time. So yeah, any strength, for, I, I know, you know, core strength is obviously key, but if you've got any exercises that might help. Yeah. And, and to my point, uh, oh, for us, it's slightly different. Um, we want the wing to be as, have as much tension through it as, as possible. The more tension, the more rigid it is. Um, so we'll be flying for around two minutes um, where we have, we're holding our, all of our muscles locked out is probably the best way to say it. So if you yeah. if you had to point your toes and, and straighten your quads and straighten your calves and everything is like as, as tense as it can be for two minutes, 
um, it's quite exhausting after you do five or six jumps in a day. Yeah, uh, slightly different movements to what Jules is doing, but yeah, it, um, yeah. At the end of the day, I'm kind of massaging my legs with some deep heat and a, and a massage gun just to kind of bring the bring the muscles back to life for because yeah. we could be doing this for two or three days. Loosen up all that tone. Yeah, I can imagine that's that's it's quite a lot, especially because you're having to sort of kick your your shins down to like bite into that air. Um, yeah, um, well, so, so, no, it was, it's, it's it's more you want your leg straight and and to to straighten your leg, like you can have your 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 calves locked out and your toes pointed, but your knees still bent, and the only way to get around that is to lock out your quad. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Does that make sense? So now your quads locked out, your calves are locked out, your 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 toes are locked out, the whole range of leg muscles through your core, your your glutes, that's it's just all locked out for two minutes. Yeah. That's tough. I mean it's it's sort of like being able to do like a dish in a way. Uh like a, a gymnastics dish lying on your back and keeping your arm your legs straight, pointing your toes and keeping your core on and seeing how long you can hold that. It's I guess it's sim somewhat like that, except the dish should be a little bit more like this, but flying yeah. like that um so things with the quads i mean i could always give you uh, like prescribe um position specific exercises where you, you know you'd be like having a theraband in the front of your foot and you're basically just trying to hold against the theraband maybe i'll bring that forwards a bit you're holding against the theraband and you're just trying to sustain that position um, and maybe even slightly move it uh, through a small amount of range for a sustained time. But I think sometimes what's best is just to try to get those muscles moving through a range of motion so they're not quite stiffening too much in that position. So, uh, for again, for the quads, um, uh, you'd want them to be able to be able to contract in that sort of stretched position and then bring themselves out of it getting them through a, a, a nice range of motion. So I think a, a nice one that um, I do and sometimes uh, we used to do a lot for sprinting is sort of lean back kicks. It's a nice one for the quads because it has to stabilize the hip as they both move together. And so all that is, is you're just doing a kick as you're leaning back and you can sort of walk through the room just doing this. And what you'll feel is as you do it, you're extending, right? And your, your, your quadriceps and your hip flexors, they're going into a stretch while they're also having to uh, stabilize it. And you feel a stretch through that area, but you're also having to contract core muscles and you can just walk, walk down the street like that. And that's a great exercise. It looks cool too. Lean back kicks. Great for hip mobility, um, get the muscles to contract in an elongated position. And I find sometimes they're better than these isometric exercises, which is these sustained exercises, because a lot of the times a strength and conditioning coach will be like, okay, what do you do? You do that position. All right, let's put you in that position under load and get you to hold it for the, the same amount of time you do for your sport. But I feel like you're going to, you, you probably build too much static tone that way. Um, muscles get stiffer. And then sometimes they also fatigue easier. So I think going through that range of motion, getting their muscles to stretch and then come out of that stretch for the contraction um, and getting used to that, I think that that's just a nice, simple, uh, a simple exercise that, that could help uh, with the hips. Yeah, cool. Thanks. So um, exercises like those as opposed to squats and... That yeah, well, yeah, squats won't get you into too much extension. I mean, squats will, you know, build, build your quads and your glutes. Um, but the positions that they're putting you in, um, they're good for just overloading the muscles in themselves. You're just wanting to get some, some more um, hypertrophy of the muscles. They're perfect because you can overload those movements. But I don't think they'd be too specific in helping, uh, in helping your strength in more of these extended positions. Because the extended position of the squat is the easiest part of the squat. Anyone can, can unrack and just stand there and then re-rack. That's the easiest part. It's the flex positions that are the hardest. Um, 
So because your hip is in an extended position, and I guess your knees are also in an extended position, then I'd be focusing on, um, you know, more movements that, that put you in there. Yeah, cool. Makes sense. Thanks. Um, scissor runs is also a good one. So it's like when you're running, it's a, it'd probably just be a, you know, a good warm up. You're running with locked knees almost. So you're kind of just doing this as you run. I can't, I won't be able to give you much range here, but you see it in sprinting a lot, running like that. You're just having to force legs forwards without the hip flexion and knee flexion. You're just having to do that. Scissor runs, very tiring. You feel your hamstrings quite a bit as well. Um, but you know, they're, they're great strength and conditioning things for people who need stiff leg um, strength. Thanks, Dan. Um, <clears throat> it's 11.30 now. So um, if anyone has any more questions, um, maybe we can leave it to next week because we're going to be chatting with you again the same time next week. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, so maybe come with a, anyone who didn't get to ask any questions for Dan to, um, to you know, write some questions down or even send them to you. Would that be possible, Dan? To yeah, that's perfect. Something to, to prepare so I can sort of know where to direct the, the conversation would be great. Awesome. Yeah. Um, well, thanks so much for your time. Yeah, and, thanks for having me. <laughs> and thanks everyone for attending. And um, we'll see you next week. Yeah. Great. I, everyone should try their little chin uh, sit up and you can all tell me who got to 30 seconds. Will do. Cheers. Sure. Thanks, sit Dan. Up. Thank you. <laughs>